Let's get right down to business. You have a new short position. It is in what stock? It's in OSI Systems, which most people would better know it as the maker of RapaScan, which are the airport scanners and scanning equipment. What's the issue with this company? So we think this company is rotten to the core. We've actually okay. caught so <laughs> not mincing game words. Game set match. Yeah, no. Um, we we actually have what we think is smoking gun proof that when this company uh, got a key turnkey contract a few years ago in actually Albania, but it's worth 150 to 250 million top line. Um, that they paid a bribe or kickback of almost half of that concession, and so that's to me this is damning evidence. Then we also look at. They're really the major, major contract these guys have is a turnkey contract in Mexico. Now that's up for renewal next year, possibly early part of the year. And the pricing on that appears to be egregious. And a lot of investors don't understand the economics of this because the company has not been very forthright about it. We estimate that one contract in Mexico is worth about 50, 55 percent of the company's EBITDA for last fiscal year. So if that goes away, it's a big deal. And just to kind of put a punctuation mark on how egregious we think the pricing is there, we estimate that the EBITDA margin on that Mexico contract is a 55 percent plus EBITDA margin, whereas the rest of the company's business, it's about seven and a half percent margin. So if you own OSI right now, you're basically owning it for this one contract in Mexico that's up for renewal and should be looked at very closely. So let me be clear. You believe you have found evidence of bribery or kickbacks in Albania. And if I understand you correctly, the pricing on the Mexican contract suggests is suggestive of something similar. So we have Albania in terms of what we think is a smoking gun. We've also spoken to a number of former employees who painted a picture of this company as just, within the Rapiscan division anyway, constantly breaking rules and crossing the line. So if you take a company that does business in that way and you look at this contract in Mexico that's 15% of revenue, but again, we think about 50 to 55% of EBITDA, you have to ask yourself, Mexico, Massively fat contract. Why is that contract so fat? This really should be scrutinized upon renewal. Carson, you have described the approach that you take to research and short selling as market based prosecution. Any prosecutor has to look for motive. What's the motive here? These people, this company, has a real business. Oh, gee, Eric, I mean, it's, it's money. I mean, companies lie, companies do bad things. I mean, it's really the people within him that do that. But, I mean, it's about the bottom line. But is it, what I'm getting at is, if you're right, and they bribed somebody in Albania, and if it's possible that something similar went on in Mexico, it was because if they didn't bribe, and if somebody didn't receive a kickback, they would have lost the contract to someone else? Look, I don't know. I mean, when you look at Albania, what happened there was they set up a company in Albania that, that owns the concession. So they're awarded the concession, set the company up, then they transferred 49% of that company away one month after forming it to, nominally anyway, a guy who's a doctor, an Albanian doctor, who the only thing we know that he does is apparently he runs some hospital in Tirana. They transferred half of this concession to him for $4.50. Okay, like, that's, you know, of course the company didn't make a big announcement. Four dollars and fifty cents effectively US. for half the economic value of a contract worth 150 to 200 million dollars. Yes. So I really can't think of a good explanation other than this is a kickback of some sort for that type of business, for that type of transaction. Carson, we've known you since your call on Sina Forest. You said that company was a zero. It proved to be a zero. How much conviction do you have about OSI systems? compared with, say, Sina Force or anything else that you have shorted in the period since? So that OSI Systems is a, you know, is a company that engages in significant corruption, I mean, 100 percent convicted on that. We have smoking gun evidence. Now, a lot of this depends on Mexico, okay? I mean, if Mexico got renewed on the same terms, you're not going to see the bottom fall out of it. But if 
they, there is scrutiny of this contract. If the pricing is lowered a decent bit, that will obviously wash through if our estimates are anywhere near correct to the P&L in a big way. OSI almost certainly is going to sue you. Any reason you could be wrong? Well, I mean, on Albania? No. I mean, give me a better explanation. And, and then tell everybody why you haven't announced this a few years ago. So, look, I would disagree that they're definitely going to sue. If they want to sue, you know, we'll accept service. It's not hard to do it. But if they sue, we're going to open these guys up. And we, they're, I'm confident that there are a lot of skeletons in that closet. What do you know about the CEO, Deepak Chopra? Not the Deepak right. Chopra everyone else is familiar with. It's another guy who happens to be called Deepak Chopra, yes. whose background appears to go all date back to you know, the early days of the semiconductor industry mm -hmm. in California with Fairchild and Intel. Yeah, look, he's a real entrepreneur. He's built a real business, and he's not that Deepak Chopra. But, you know, there's, I mean, one of the things that's a little bit concerning about this company, that the picture that's been painted for us is that, Within the senior executive ranks, there's a tighter inner circle of Mr. Chopra and uh, another executive, A.J. Mira, who's signed the power of attorney authorizing the sale of uh, the 49 percent uh, in Albania. Do you think it's possible that the Deepak Chopra we're talking about doesn't know what's going on? Look, I don't know. Litigation would probably answer that question. Uh, but certainly the picture that's been painted for us is that he's very involved in all aspects of the business. Like any public company, OSI Systems has an auditor, Moss Adams. I checked on their filings. Where's the auditor here? Well, okay, number one, I'm never impressed when somebody says, oh, you know, we're audited by XYZ Big Four because look, we can paint to a litany of audit failures by each of them. But I'm even less impressed when you're a reasonably large company and you're not audited by Big Four. And I don't know that Moss Adams' capabilities in Albania is, you know, rock star. Maybe I'm missing something. But the other thing is, actually, OSI used to be audited by Big Four um, when it was uh, about 10, 10, 15 years ago. So there's kind of a question as you grew in the post 9-11 world and you went overseas, why, why take a step down? Carson, before we finish, I want to raise another point. You've chosen this short to do something you haven't done before, which is to release concurrent with this announcement a video. I'm going to play a short clip from the video. This thing is a seven clause certification regarding anti-bribery laws. Actually, sorry, it goes on to a second page. Eight parts. There is very little specificity as to the type of training they have to provide. I don't see any schedule to this agreement that lays out what that curriculum is, but there's a lot of documentation around how not to bribe officials. So in this video, we see you doing a lot of that. We see you talking to your team. We see you in a car, on a cell phone, talking about what you believe to be the nefarious dealings inside OSI systems and with its contractual partners. Why do a video? We're used to seeing these very detailed reports from Muddy Waters. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a very detailed written report that we're putting out, but there are two reasons why we're doing the video. Uh, and this is an experiment. But number one is really think it's important to try to expand, I guess, the people who consume this kind of content. Because we're in this world now where people are just throwing money into these ETFs that are passively allocating it. And I think it's important to educate a larger swath of the population here as to there are reasons why you don't just want to close your eyes and buy. You're trying to promote price discovery, in other words. Yeah, I mean, like, exactly, and in, in really try to open up this other world of finance be, you know, because there is a lot of, I think there is a lot of general interest appeal in many of the shorts that we do, maybe not when we're talking EBITDA, but when we're talking about, hey, you know, taking half of your concession and giving it to some doctor in Albania for no good reason. Those sorts of things, I think, have appeal. So I want, I think it's important to expand this audience that is You want people to in consume. Albania to know. You want people in Mexico to know, yes. for example. But also people in America to say, oh, you know what? It, you know, do, if I'm just throwing money blindly at companies, are they maybe doing things with it that they shouldn't be doing? So that's one. But the other thing is a little bit more defensive. And I've been doing this business for eight years. I mean, it was over seven years ago, Eric, that I was on my show or on your show for the first time. And during that period of time, human attention spans have not gotten longer. 
you know, we're, we've all been reprogrammed by our PDAs. And I used to, back then, I used to think people, maybe the average investor read the first three pages of our report. I mean, that I think would be wildly optimistic now. So delivering this content in a way that's more suited to today's brain function is something that I wanted to try.